This week on the Home Studio Hangout podcast, we have Noam Levenberg of Safari Pedals. I look at Safari as being kind of my outlet of doing weird and wacky stuff. We talk about how he got his start working in large commercial studios. I was actually lucky enough to, to work in a bunch of big studios. What it was like putting out his first plugin. The world was kind of like hogging me and saying like, oh, you're making cool stuff. And some interesting things that I think only Safari Pedals does. Physicals, is that something that you're going to try to do with some other pedals as well or some other plugins as well in the future? I have so many things to say about it. Welcome back to the Home CD Hangout Podcast. I'm your host, Drew, not joined by my co-host, Josh. He's stuck in Atlanta traffic. And if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. But I am joined by uh, today's guest, Noam Levenberg of Safari Pedals. And Noam, I'm super glad you're able to come on. We've been trying to get you on for a little bit. Uh, so super stoked yeah, to have you. Thanks for having me, man. I'm, I'm so sorry uh, for not being <laughs> you available. Apo- you don't have to but, um, apologize, man. I, You're I a am, busy dude. <laughs> yeah, I, I am stoked to be here. And uh, and yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Well, yeah, you, it's funny. You guys actually reached out to me a while back. Yeah. And I was super excited because I had seen some stuff uh, of you guys kind of starting. And this was, I think this was last year. I had started to see you guys really start pushing the Safari stuff uh, pretty hard. And I was like, oh, that seems really interesting. And then I got, you know, I got the email and I was like, oh, this is exciting. I'm excited to check out this stuff. And it didn't disappoint. I'm very like I want the other reason, like I was really hoping Josh could be here is like we've made especially some of these plugins like very big staples in our templates now. Um, Amazing. I know Josh and uh, he's got a production partner named Lee Rouse, who, you know, has worked with like Teddy Swims and uh, he helped break him. And they work with a bunch of like uh, octane rock groups here in the States. And uh, they've they've really made some very cool effects change plugins like with your stuff and, you know, vocal throws and all that stuff that really just add that extra layer of of sauce to your to their production so and like for me it's been a great you know sound design thing because i was telling you like i do a lot of sound design work for a bunch of bands and it's been a really cool uh a really cool different take that i feel like i'm getting sounds that not a lot of other people are getting um yeah with your stuff so yeah just wanted to compliment you on making great things out the gate man thank you so much i mean that that means the world to me i um <clears throat> I look at Safari as being kind of my outlet of doing weird and wacky stuff. <laughs> um, and apparently other people like it too, which is like, I, I'm like hundred percent serious. Yeah. It's, man. Uh, it's flattering. It's amazing to hear that other people enjoy the same kind of things <laughs> audio wise that I do. Especially the wild and wacky stuff, because you dig it pretty, pretty wild with some of these choices. <laughs> I mean, who puts who puts that mini that reverb distortion combo together for that for the, your dirty dog? I mean, that's wild to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, first of all, dirty dog, I will say, is uh, Joe Ciccarelli's yeah creation. It was his kind of master creation. Mm-hmm. And I just went with him. Um, and I, I did on, on that one. I was like, maybe we went too far. And he's like, <laughs> can we have it a little bit wilder? <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, man. Yeah, it, it, it is a really fun plugin. But I, I think in general, like for Safari Pedals, me being uh, in the studio for the good for the uh, last 20 years or so, mm-hmm. I've worked with all of the different plugins and. I kind of felt like I want to do something that's more in the world of like inspiration Mm -hmm. rather than like actual tools, if that makes sense. So I wasn't trying to make the best EQ or the best compressor that has all the different features. I wanted something to have a really kind of specific flavor and taste, which is what I think a lot of times uh productions and mixes that i worked on missed Um, yeah yeah well i i I feel like i feel like what you guys do really really well is you put 
something like I said, it's it's a bunch of left field things, but you put a bunch of things into one plugin that like I would probably get to the same result eventually, but it'd be like five plugins deep, like trying out a bunch of different stuff or being like, I kind of want to. So let's just use like maybe the Flamingo verb or the dirty dog is like, I want a vocal throw that sounds really different. And then like, I know that I can grab a handful of your plug or like some of the delays, the yak or some of the other ones. And like, throw them on there and be like, let's just turn some knobs or use a couple presets and like, see how the, see what it does to the vocal throw. And um, to compliment you on the dirty dog specifically, like it's become one of my favorite uh, hip hop ad lib vocals, like plugins. Oh yeah. It, it does that really well. It Thanks, does man. that so well. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I agree with you. And I, I think what you just said is like, is amazing. Cause that's exactly how I th see it. Like I had all these different like complicated chains that sometimes were like a send that goes to another send, but it's mm -hmm. side chained and compressed. And then it all comes to an aux channel and da 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 da. Um, and actually all of the, all of the Safari plugins are uh, sort of those chains bundled into one plugin i'm trying to think if there's any exceptions but i don't i don't think so it's it's all kind of what if we take all of these different aspects of something and then just like bundle it into one box and the fun thing about that is like it's kind of like i don't know if you you have this like if you had this experience but sometimes um what i used to do was if i would be producing and mixing a song Mm -hmm. once i'm done with the production i'll kind of commit the stems and then mix the stems with a new session and you mm -hmm. feel like kind of oh i'm i'm kind of starting from a new point of view because i already kind of kind of committed with all yeah. the other stuff before 100 percent uh so what's funny it's funny you say that i actually do that that is like a staple of my thing is i use ableton i produce and write in ableton um, right. because i find the midi functionality is better i can generally be more creative with it because i know how to work really fast i think the automation's faster the routing's faster whatever you, you know i that's kind of my thing and then i print everything and then it goes into pro tools and that's where i'm like more it's funny. I, it prevents the context switching of like if I'm in Ableton and I'm trying to still be creative, but I need to be more like analytical. Now I have like I'm in Pro Tools. I'm in more analytical mode. I'm in mixing mode. I'm in like, you know, I'm dissecting things. I'm like saying, ah, producer me is an idiot because now there's this massive <laughs> <laughs> like bump or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. But I treat it like its own fully separate like mix scenario. Uh, I think that's, that's I think that's smart. That's something that like I used to always enjoy doing. I didn't always do it like because sometimes you're lazy, you know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes like you're like, well, it's almost mixed kind of so I can just like, yeah, do, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. 100 percent, 100 percent. But I kind of look at Safari in that same regard where like it's um, it. To me, like wh when I when I use it, it feels like a lot of times it gives me a different perspective because it doesn't have all the kind of, you know, 15 plugins in one chain with a send, mm -hmm. with a thing, with a thing. It's just like one plugin. And then and then you can tweak that, but you can't really kind of make that into something that's completely different. Um, 100 percent. if that makes sense yeah no it really does um I, so i would love maybe to give the people some background on you because you know you're talking about you know doing more production stuff like how did we get from uh oh i'm interested in music to i'm gonna make some of the craziest <laughs> plugins that the world has ever seen <laughs> uh, oh thanks man um i mean Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and make this short. No, that's fine. I totally understand. I t it's it's a weird and loaded question. Yeah, I I mean, okay, I um I was obsessed with music ever since I remember myself. Um, mm -hmm. I don't come from a musical family. Uh, 
first time I really kind of picked up an instrument was um, I I, ha I have a, an older brother who's uh, four years older than me, and he got a guitar for his, like, I think it was like his 15th birthday or something. And I was so jealous just because you're always jealous of your siblings. So yeah. <laughs> I was like, I want a guitar. Um, so I, I started playing uh, as soon as he did just to kind of fit in. But um, it was pretty like obvious to me that <clears throat> I like I like listening to music and I like mm -hmm. playing around with instruments. But I kind of went through all of the instrument instruments and sucked at all of them. I was like yeah. a bad guitar player. And then the 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 like guitar teacher was like, maybe you should try bass because like, yeah. <laughs> you know um and then i was i sucked at bass and then i sucked at drums and uh all all of the other instruments too like piano yeah. and, and other stuff um and it got to a point where i was at high school and i was hanging out with the bands but like i, I wasn't good enough to play with them yeah. like they were obsessed on like playing and i was not so yeah it got to this point where it was all like all my friends were musicians, but I didn't really practice. So mm -hmm. I started just like being the guy that does the other stuff, which is like, oh, we're, you know, recording a demo or we're doing this gig. Maybe you can come and, and uh, help us out or do the live PA sound. And mm -hmm. uh, I was messing around with stuff. And as soon as I got uh, Cubase, which was my first uh, DAW yeah. on a PC, it was like, I I really like I remember that time. It felt to me like I'm addicted to heroin. Like I can't. Yeah. Oh yeah, dude. I was like, I can't go to school. I can't go to sleep. I can't eat. I I just want to make, dude, like, stuff 100%. with Cubase. You know. Um, no, I. So it's really funny. I had that exact same kind of scenario where it was like, I wasn't. You know younger age school middle school high school kind of time and like i was in band i would do a lot of stuff but i was never it's i never i hate practicing i think that's more of what it was is like the <laughs> idea of like oh i need to spend an hour a day on just running scales on a thing sounds right. like the worst time to me <laughs> ever yeah uh so i got like good enough at a lot of different instruments to be like, I could hang. Exactly. But, th but that's about it. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, but very similar situation. I got a cracked version of reason, reason like four or something like that, like back yeah. in the day. And, uh, yeah, I, I was like, Oh, I can like use all of my knowledge from all of these things and put it into one DAW and like make stuff. That's yeah. amazing. What yeah. in the world? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and uh, I was hooked so bad. Um, I, I just started like early on. I, I, I was uh, recording punk rock bands from mm -hmm. like older kids uh, around around my, you know, uh, my school and stuff. And um, that those recordings were terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel that. Yeah. Um, but they were a start. <laughs> they they were a start. Um and then yeah, I slowly slowly started working at at um a large studio facility. I was actually lucky enough to to work in a bunch of big studios uh in Israel. That's awesome. And uh I was a runner and then a, an assistant and then an engineer. Um and I I just stick to it for a long time and I kind of had the same feeling um, of being addicted to crack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. With uh, with with mixing for the mm -hmm. like when I started kind of when I figured out like oh so all these like clients that come into the studio they record it here but then they mix it somewhere else and then mm -hmm. started getting into mixing and really found my niece there so i was like really focused on mixing for yeah for a long long time did and, you have the um, instance of uh the first time you ever got stems from somebody that you didn't produce on 
and you were like, this is the weirdest way. Like that happened to me. Like the first time I ever got a remote mixing job and until yeah. I had somebody send me stems and I like didn't really know the person didn't produce on it. And I'm just getting the stuff and I'm like super nervous. Cause I was like, either this is going to be very bad or this is going to be very good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, for me, it was more of like a kind of fade in because I, I, I my my first uh, mixing gigs were stuff that I was recording, and then mm -hmm. after the recording, I came up to the band and I was like, "Yo, do you want me to mix this for you? I'll do it like half price or or even for free for the first few few times." Yeah, um, just to get you know my my experience Even going. Reps. Yeah. Um, so that was like that was fun and then <clears throat> it slowly became it, it moved into like this situation where the facility where i used to work in which i'm actually still still in which is called pluto studios which is uh it's a it's a really big studio facility in in, in israel it's like uh 12 studios in one building oh dang so it got to a point where i was just like in a mixing suite and and uh some of the stuff i would record and then mix but most of the stuff i would just mix um and yeah did that for a really long time and it, it got to a point where i love mixing but it was like kind of repetitive in a way because i was like doing a mix a day um every day and i mean it was great, but it, it also felt like it's not something I want to keep doing for the rest of my life. Um, and no disrespect to anybody sure. that does do that, you know, constantly. I kind of kind of miss parts of it. Um, yeah. But it was it was at a point where um, I felt like I wasn't really contributing enough. Mm -hmm. So. It was like one of those things where as technology got better and better, it just felt like the the productions got better and better. And then the mixing got like a smaller portion of of what was needed to be done. And it started mm -hmm. feeling more like kind of mastering in a, in a way or like STEM mastering. I can understand it's, that. Yeah. I, it's like it, it's like this... we want the rough mix to stay exactly the same. Uh, just polished by 10%. Just make it like, yeah, just make it like, five percent better yeah um, and that wasn't like my my shtick my shtick was like let's go crazy let's overhaul this <laughs> yeah. thing yeah yeah <laughs> heavy handed dude i totally understand i totally understand because i do agree with you like as technology has gotten more accessible and you know like it's become cheaper but also like as information has become more accessible as well like you have these people that are producing self-producing that are getting I mean, they're they're getting stuff damn near done, yeah. if not fully done on their Yeah. And, and then and then um, what happened was I got offered uh, uh, actually somewhat of a corporate job to mm -hmm. run the audio department at a company called Artlist, which. Uh, yeah. Which yeah, I they, saw shares the same studio as you guys, right? Yeah, true. Um, because of me. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, okay. That's awesome. <laughs> so when when I started working at Artlist as uh, head of audio, I brought them into to this space to essentially kind of build a studio facility for their needs, and mm -hmm. they're amazing. I mean, I, I love the people at Artlist, and I think they're doing an amazing they do, job. They do incredible stuff. I think I I uh, pretty much every one of my video because I'm big, I'm friends with a lot of video guys too. Right. Uh, I think every single one of my video friends uses Artlist for something. They're really, really serious on like high quality audio production, yeah. and uh, they do a lot of it. Mm -hmm. So I was really lucky to, um, you know, be a part of the audio team. And then, um, what I what I realized that Artlist is kind of what we were just talking about is like we can kind of cherry pick uh music producers that already do like a really good job at mm -hmm. like the audio side of things and then yeah we they don't really need a mix they they might need like a stem master of sorts yeah. but like a lot of them 
don't even need a mix because it just it sounds so good and yeah. even more than that like you know how sometimes you get stems and you're like you listen to the rough and you want to change one thing but then once you change it the something Changes else everything else kind of yeah. gets ruined and then mm-hmm. It's one of those things that like doesn't hit right. Maybe that weird frequency in the 808 that's just like ringing for some reason is just like the the vibe for the song for some reason. Exactly. So I I feel like I mastered that kind of mentality when I was working at Artless because there was Mm -hmm. such a large quantity of of songs coming in. Yeah. Um, And I kind of became a mastering engineer in many ways. And got into mastering as well and, and got yeah. into like the the little fine details of just like you said, like how the song hits and how how do you um, kind of keep everything intact and, and maybe like not do that big, massive change and like wild delay mm. throw yeah. <laughs> that I used to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I, I really liked it for, for a long period of time. And I, I did that for like uh, four years. And, but the company, the company really, really grew. And it, it became like a massive, uh, yeah. massive, massive company. And um, I just felt like, again, I had this itch that I wanted to maybe try something else. And I always had ideas for plugins. I just never really like jumped into the water and like fully committed on it. Um, And then I just said, you know, fuck it. Let's, uh, let's do this. I'm I'm too old to wait. You know what I mean? And I just wanted to kind of go with what I felt was right. And I I really, really didn't know how people would react to it. I mean, when I released the first plugin, which was Gorilla Drive, um, I realized during the release that this is like the first I've been working around like artists and musicians for most of my life. Mm-hmm. And I've never released a song or, or, or anything really. I've never released like an oh, art personal that was music. my own. Yeah. And the, when I released the gorilla drive, I kind of felt kind of felt the same way as probably how a, mu- a musician feels when he releases a song because it, it really came from my heart and I really didn't know how people would react to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the first like month was like, like really, really hard. I don't know. Like when you release something like out to the world, Oh yeah, you, you're so like, it's, you're, like yeah, it's a totally different feeling (laughs) yeah exactly it it changes your perspective on things and it it was it was was shocking but it it also makes you think how do how do artists do this all the time (laughs) so hard yeah like how do people just do this like on top of like you know maybe even doing content and then just like fully just putting themselves out there all the time so deeply it's like oh man i'm a, a different level of respect i absolutely um Definitely. And um, yeah, that was that was a year ago when I released the first plugin and actually got a lot of of really positive support from the community. I know this Mm -hmm. like this, like the audio community is known for like talking shit and like being rude and (laughs) sometimes and uh, and being like really harsh on people and stuff. But I felt the opposite way completely when it, when when i you know came out with the plugins i felt like the yeah. world was kind of like hugging me and saying like oh you're making cool stuff dude like you know what i mean i, I yeah. felt really like a positive energy coming but the, I, I also think that maybe and maybe this is like it's like a generational thing now because it's like i feel like back in the day people were a lot stricter i mean they still are pretty they're pretty they're pretty rough sometimes in the audio community but like back in the day it was like until you prove yourself we're gonna give you nothing but hate and then now it's like maybe they're a little more lenient to to newer people coming onto the scene um i think it has a lot to do with so many people are putting themselves out there now 
that they're right. starting to understand like what we said like it's all it's hard to put yourself out there and because so many people are doing it people are recognizing that like oh well maybe we give people a chance a little more rather than just like fully railing them from the from the start <laughs> right right um yeah i mean i think it's it's that but i think it's also um I think it's also like this kind of thing where musicians and producers and audio engineers I think are a little bit fed up with big companies kind of 100% forcing them into subscriptions and forcing Bro, them into you know what I mean and I, have, I don't want to I don't want to bash you, any no, company No you have you have I I have friends that have a bunch of subscriptions I I personally hate subscriptions. The The fact that I'm on a Pro Tools subscription right now makes me want to tear my eyes out. <laughs> I hate it so much. <laughs> but like, and I know other plugin companies do it and that's fine. It's not for me. I hate right. the fact that if I, I want to pull up a session from two years ago and I don't have the subscription for the plugins that are on that session anymore, that session is going to be jacked up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... I think subscriptions are good for some things and, and bad for others. I think that like, you know, I mean, this is just my opinion, but like yeah. if you're starting out and you're kind of trying to figure out what's right for you, maybe a subscription yeah. is not so bad. Cause you can no. like agreed 100%. You can spend a little bit of money and see if it works for you. And like, maybe in a few months you realize that you want something else and that's it's it's like it's a cool way to to get started but you're generally um, also not hopping from like paid project to paid project when you're doing that yeah exactly yeah. um definitely and I, I and i think that like i don't want to name any names no it's fine but there's <laughs> there's some companies that like take advantage of mm -hmm. you know that whole concept of like oh you're you're a prisoner now yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I and like I had what you described uh, many times over my career, where I had purchased the plugin like perpetually, but I couldn't mm -hmm. open it on a on a session, or couldn't open a session on a newer OS or what, whatever. Um, so mm -hmm. I I kind of try and take all of that in account with Safari pedals. But what what I was um, trying to say earlier is like. I think that part of the part of the like the positive positivity that I'm I was feeling mm -hmm. uh is like the community saying like you know like oh you're one of us and you're making a plugin that's cool man yeah you know what I mean it, yeah because because a lot of these companies and again I don't want to like diss anyone but like a lot of these companies didn't even start from like a audio engineering or production perspective they were no, like they're they're from a from a in like a technical engineering perspective exactly they never worked with and, a client exactly and, and that's like that's a weird place to start a yeah. audio company from in my yeah opinion. it really is <laughs> it's like why <laughs> yeah yeah it's a very strange choice it's a very strange choice yeah. i'm sure there's history to it but like still no, I, th I think i think that there is like a lot of uh there's there is actually like a lot of anomalies uh mm -hmm. in audio that interest a lot of like really smart engineers and mathematicians yeah. and i think that's part of it it's like mm -hmm. one of those things where like your geekiness and like like your i don't know like your sense of adventure can meet and uh and be fruitful so yeah, think, it does make sense, but some of the plugins that I see coming out, you you kind of know yeah. from looking at it that it's not made from people that 100%. make songs and stuff. One hundred percent. So 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 now we're kind of up to date, right? So you, you've you talked about releasing Safari pedals stuff, and I gotta say, like, so one, I guess the big question for me was the thing that interested me the most was the form factor the right. idea of choosing a guitar pedal that's and that could also be another reason why we're talking about the the 
kindness you've received up front because you're you're putting it in something that is inherently familiar with a right. lot of people who started in their bedrooms with probably a lot of people's first purchase as like a producer musician was probably a guitar pedal of some kind. Exactly. Um, that's which, that's like that a very interesting choice from you as well to do that. Yeah, I think I think um, the guitar pedal thing. I have so many things to say about it, but like, <laughs> um, so when when I was doing a lot of mixing, I got to a realization at some point that like, so I had this thing which is very uncommon these days, um, but. I used to force as much as I could uh, clients to come in and do the mix with me mm -hmm. and not send over files and then me sending them files. Because yeah. what would happen was like when I started, um, I used to do the sending files thing mm -hmm. and I would get rejections. And I, I not even like, like rejection, I, I would get people like paying me and then going to someone else and and remixing the song yeah and that would frustrate me i would i would like i wouldn't i i it sucks you it, yeah it sucks because yeah, it, it just sucks cause i could like you listen to the the song later when it comes out like on the radio or something and it's not your mix and you're like i could have mixed it that way if they would have sure like, asked that's not a yeah. problem like i just didn't i didn't get what was needed in that particular gig and and uh that led me to wanting to mix with the client in the studio and when i did that it kind of really opened my world into like what people want mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah um and one of the kind of tricks that i used to do is like uh i used to have this massive uh stomp pedal rack in the studio Mm -hmm. And whenever like an artist um, that wouldn't necessarily be too much into like technical stuff would say these things where, you know, artists sometimes say like, oh, I, I don't know, something with the vocals, you know, the reverb isn't what I want, but mm -hmm. I don't know what I want. And like, yeah, it, yeah. you know, you get into this rabbit hole. I would just hook it up to the chain of of pedals and let the guy like just mix it the way he wanted it and it always was so fun because like he was having a good time i yeah. was like chilling and and like being like oh that's i would never have done that but that's pretty rad you know um yeah <laughs> and um it was just like a way of communicating i think and then when i, when I was thinking about like doing a plugin company, I was like, I have all these crazy ass guitar pedals mm -hmm. um, that are all like boutique. Mm -hmm. And obviously there are like guitar pedal plugins, but they're always kind of like the same shtick of like yeah. a tube screamer and uh, a like, memory man, a memory man. Exactly. And mm -hmm. it's like, okay, those are cool, but what about all the like boutique wild sounds with like yeah. crazy names and stuff? So. Where, the, where the pedals are like super thick for almost <laughs> seemingly no reason and yeah. like they don't fit next to anything. <laughs> yeah. And and they have like these weird labels. Yeah. Which, or, which no actually, labels or no labels. Or no labels. For some reason. Yeah. Or, or labels with like L. Yeah. <laughs> or like it's just a symbol <laughs> or something. Yeah. yeah. I love those. <laughs> Cause yeah, and, and and it's one of those things where I felt like almost everybody can relate to. It's it's something that is like just intuitive and something mm -hmm. that you always have fun with, and you you always find like a cool sound. And the only times I can think of when I was like in my mixing career that I didn't use stomp pedals was because I was like too lazy to hook up the the stomp boxes. I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna bother patching everything up and da, da 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 so i think that's like another thing where it was just like in plug-in format that's like so much fun no know? yeah it's super cool 
It also allows you to get really interesting with the uh, with the cut, like the art on the on it physically. It's like I feel like you could do a lot more than with a plugin sometimes with that. Um, just like I mean, just a, a good example of a version of that is like I think the art for the time machine is sick. Yeah. Um, Thanks, man. There's the the gor- the gorilla with the space outfit on it is awesome. I think the owl control actually has a really cool art um yeah and like they all are interesting and super unique in their own way lion master is another really good one that um i'm working on a i'm actually putting in a youtube video myself but it's yeah it's super it's like very like aesthetically pleasing and it makes you want to put it on there even just to like turn the knob you know what I mean? Right? Yeah, that's <laughs> I'm so happy you say that. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like um the again the aesthetics, you know, um are the stuff that I I like and um mm-hmm. I I don't know. I feel like everybody's like doing all these like black on white professional and even like with the, the names thing. and stuff, it's always like EQ001. Yeah. Why we're we're making music isn't this supposed to be like fun? Why, why are it's, you guys? It's crazy that people that are hyper creative when they get when they get to like creating things, it's like sometimes it's the yeah. most bland thing possible. No, it's like what are we like? What? Why? What are we, why, what are we why doing are we, here? <laughs> why are we calling this the the PPPR two? Like what? Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. Call it something fun, you know? Yeah, dude. <laughs> One hundred percent. Uh the um so I, another thing I found interesting, and actually I didn't realize this until I was checking out I think I was checking out the site to uh make a short on one of the plugins, and I realized that you had physicals. Oh yeah. Of of the it's the gorilla drive and the time machine that you have the physicals of, which what great choices to have physicals of. Um <laughs> Specifically, the time machine. I think the time machine is like, if somebody makes lo-fi music in general, like lo-fi hip hop and like any kind of that stuff, I feel like the time machine is a must-have for them, in my opinion, mainly because you have so many different compression options and the styles are so curated to that style of music. Um, but I find it I find it super interesting that you chose to do physicals. Is that something that you're going to try to do with some other pedals as well or some other plugins as well in the future? Well, um, so the physicals, I, I actually started with the physicals. Um, that was like my first game plan was like making my, my idea was let's make stomp pedals for uh, like XLRs. So like line inputs mm-hmm. and then also mic inputs and it has a microphone preamp in it oh that's um, cool i didn't realize that yeah it's it's why it, that those are really really wild yeah that's what sick. happened was i released those and they sold out in a matter of like two days um and you could not imagine in your wildest dreams how hard it is to like make those. Oh, I, a, bro, I can't imagine. <laughs> a make those and then B also like my like finding the all of the uh elements that go into the pedal mm-hmm. every time is so hard because especially like, because they're so weird. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. It's it's true because because they have some weird components in them. And like one thing that people don't realize is like, you know how with stomp pedals, a lot of times you'll have like 10 different versions of the same pedal. Like, mm-hmm. like for example, like rat distortion, yeah. ha- you have like 10 different ones. Yeah. Um, that's because every time they went to make, you know, the next batch. Yeah. They, they ended up with one capacitor or resistor or something that's slightly like, off yeah yeah so they had to just change it it's the same for like older amps are the same way right older guitar yeah. heads are like very similar in that um or older even pieces of studio gear were kind of similar in that way too if i remember correct like certain 
mics or preamps or compressors from certain years are like the pinnacle ones, quote unquote. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I just, I, I, um, I stopped making them cause I'm still waiting to find the, yeah. the, the, the right, uh, pieces, like pieces yeah. that are missing and, uh, they all come from China. Hmm. So and they're all getting bought up by people left and right for different reasons. And there's probably not the same. And... The thing, the thing is like, there, like I, I had this conversation with a few like bigger hardware manufacturers. Mm -hmm. They all said the same thing, which is like what they do is they buy a very large stock of whatever the, you know, thing is. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they know that they can make, let's say, 10,000 of these pedals. But it's like, mm -hmm. it's a really big investment for yeah. a small company. It's like, I, I don't want to, <laughs> I, I don't want to take a loan for. Yeah, not for, you know not for I mean? that, not for a component. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when you um, could make five, five or six plugins in that time. Yeah. But at the same time, a lot of people are asking, like, I get at least like two emails a day saying, can we please have the hardware again? Dude. So. Yeah. Well, I like, so the time machine and the yak delay, I think would make very cool, like pedals for yeah. people. Uh, especially like I could see the, the, um, I think it was the time machine as a, as a drum bus, like send is awesome. It's a great, like, drum send the um the rhino reverb was the other one that i was like that would make that's like the guitar pedal if i ever <laughs> if i ever saw one that's like make it put that slap a combo jack on that bad boy so that you could use it for guitar pedal boards and as a mic thing and like that's that's like the reverb <laughs> pedal for for a lot of people's style yeah that's so cool man well, I'm going to try and, and remake them. Yeah, please do. <laughs> <laughs> please do. It would be cool to see. And I think as, it's something that not a lot of people are doing. People go full send on one of the one of the two sides. Right, right. And I think the fact that you're like, oh, I can have this digitally, but also take it on the road with me. Yeah. Is like really cool. Um, there's a but there's there's some other people that do that vice versa where they're just like they make the plug in and then they make a box that like essentially houses a the plug in. Um, yeah, there's uh you know one of the cool ones is uh Good Hertz which I, I bro I love Good Hertz. I love Good Hertz. I think they're like amazing. You're talking um, about a, a brand a brand that is doing a very similar to you guys actually in my opinion. Um thanks doing stuff that nobody else is doing yeah great stuff great and stuff. then and then they have they released they recently released um lossy as a pedal with yeah. chase bliss when i saw that i was like oh, oh shit yeah dude that's so cool. crazy yeah yeah um but yeah yeah who's who's doing that like Two plug-in companies out of the whole yeah. world are doing that. That's awesome. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. I think I think it's something cool that like, even if it's just limited run stuff, it's a cool thing for one. If it's something you use a lot, having an analog version of it is just cool. Yeah. You know, but on top of that, like I said, being able to travel with it or if it becomes a staple of your vocal chain, like I can see the Gorilla Drive being a, a staple in some people's vocal chains for certain styles of music um, or, uh, you know, the Time Machine or the Yak Delay or the Rhino Reverb being, like I said, guitars or keyboard pedals uh, being really interesting for those kind of live setups that people like to use. Yeah. Um. Well, no, I know you got to go uh, yeah, kind of soon. I, uh, we didn't have a I whole do. lot of time today, but I'm glad we were able to get you in. I would love for you to, pe to if people want to check you guys out, yeah. where can they go? Uh, where do you want to send them? 
Uh, we're, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It was really fun. It went by super quick. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so go to safaripedals.com. You can download a free 14-day trial on all of the plugins. And um, yeah, go wild, be free, <laughs> do wild shit in the studio. Yeah, man. Don't use stock plugins. Yeah, man. You you also have a oh, and for people to they have a couple sample packs also for free on their website as well. True. Uh, at safaripedals.com. So if you want to check I all those out. I don't know if you know this, but like one one of them is me playing. Really? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Uh, the first one, the lo-fi sloth is lo-fi sloth? Is That's just sick. Me trying to play. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny <laughs> i think it, awesome. it it turned out pretty okay yeah but, but it's cool it's, it's free stuff for people to check out while they're on the site yeah definitely um and then i think you're on at socials at safari pedals uh everywhere for them to all check that out so and all of these links will be in the description of the audio and video episodes on youtube and spotify and all the other places so uh if you guys want to check it out check out gnome check out safari pedals they make incredible stuff thank um, you so much man. And yeah we're proud to we're proud to use them on a lot of our sessions so thank you so much amazing man i'm i'm honored and uh thank you again for having me yeah and, uh, uh, listeners thank you so much for listening and uh we will see you guys in the next one all right Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Home Studio Hangout podcast. If you could take the time to like, subscribe. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other audio platform, go ahead and make sure you're subscribed and also leave a rating and a review. It helps the show get out to new people. And we're trying to grow every single week. Once again, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Home Studio Hangout podcast, and we'll see you next week.